Part of why I'm interested in this conversation and having intercultural conversations, just autobiographically, uh, my father's from Honduras, my mother's uh, from here in the United States, so I grew up in a half Latino, a half uh, white, English-speaking home, but surrounded by Latino family and friends. And uh, some of that negotiation, some of that tension, some of that um, conversation of navigating difference of walking into and out of different subcultures, of trying to make sense of my identity in terms of cultural hybridity, uh, being connected to, to family and friends in other countries and other parts of the world. Uh, it, it got me asking some significant questions about who God has created me to be in terms of my ethnic identity. And then also with respect to this consortium, as we think about emerging adults and think about issues of culture and race and ethnicity and class and gender, it's really important, I think, for us to have the kind of conversations that I'm hoping to have in this panel where we could see that there's points of convergence and then also points of divergence. But getting ahead of myself, so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So we'll start with the one closest to me. Uh, my name is Jimmy Rowe, and I'm a local pastor of a church called Harvest Mission Community Church. We're a non-denominational church in the Chicago area. And uh, I'm 36 years old, so technically I'm not a millennial. And uh, I'm the oldest person in my church. So that's why I'm very um, involved in this conversation, very uh, interested in emerging adults. And mostly we're reaching uh, Asian Americans, but uh, it's a multi-ethnic church as well. Um, and I've been interested to see how, um, uh, in the context of a local church, we can disciple this next generation. And so I'm a THM student here as well at Trinity, so uh, happy to be involved in this conversation. Mm -hmm. My name is Jerrica Prophet. I'm on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the University of Illinois Chicago, where I've been planting, at first, a multi-ethnic ministry, but I've recently um, felt God's call for me to invest specifically in the African diaspora, meaning students that are African Caribbean, African National, African American, to see them grow in their ethnic identity, but also the ways God might be calling them to be on mission on campus. I'm also a part-time um, volunteer with my husband at First Baptist Congregational Church where he serves as the new youth pastor. It is a church on the west side of Chicago, right by the United Center for you Bulls fans. Um, and our passion is we really desire to see God build up, transform, and renew um, those that are African Caribbean um, as well as African American grow in their ethnic identity and be launched as world changers. So that's our passion. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pearson, and I am the youth pastor at a Hispanic church in Palatine uh, called Corona de Amor, which means crown of love. Um, that is a part of the Evangelical Free Church of America. Um, if you're asking, are you Hispanic? I am not. <laughs> um, but um, I have a big heart for the Hispanic community. Uh, in 2001, I went on a mission trip to Venezuela that totally changed the direction of my life, uh, so much so that I learned uh, to speak Spanish and ended up living in Venezuela as a missionary for several years where I met my wife, who is Venezuelan. Uh, and after serving there for about three years, I was pastoring a first-generation Hispanic church in Des Plaines, and I did that for a little, a little over three years. And uh, now I'm pastoring at the... Um, uh, Hispanic Church in, in, in Palatine. I'm also a student here uh, at Trinity and in the MA uh, in Theological Studies program. Great. Would you join me in welcoming our panelists? Well, I just prepared a couple of questions and uh, I'm really eager to hear from each of you as to uh, what you're facing right now in your ministries, the kinds of things that you're seeing uh, just in the trenches, as the things that are touching down on the, on the ground of what you're doing, where you're working, the, the people with whom you're working. So I'm just going to just launch in for a little bit. We want to leave some time for uh, members of the consortium also to ask some questions as well, and even just to share some stories and to interact with what you're experiencing too on the ground. So I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time and space for that. But let me just launch in with some questions. Uh, here's the first one. What are some of the challenges that emerging adults in your ministries are facing right now? 
So uh, that's the first one. What, what challenges are emerging adults facing right now in your particular context? Um, in our church context, we have been, our, our vision is to reach out to university communities. We have a lot of young people, a lot of college students. And uh, many of them come from an Asian American background. And one of the things that we have encountered more of, and we've heard this already, but is uh, uh, in increasing um, struggle with mental health and emotional well-being. Uh, that's probably the primary issue that we are wrestling through. And so even uh, at Northwestern University, uh, we have a crisis center um, that deals with uh, uh, people struggling with suicide and depression. And uh, I was informed by the chaplain's office that Asian Americans uh, are uh, coming to these crisis centers um, in the highest percentage out of all the different um, all the different demographic groups at Northwestern. And um, uh, I was talking to Dr. Cha here uh, even years ago when he worked at Northwestern, that was the case. And that was even 10 years ago. And that has only grown significantly over the past several years. So even pastorally, I, I'm constantly dealing with uh, cases of depression or anxiety, social anxiety or these types of issues mm -hmm. on a more regular basis now, and which is a, a quandary for me as a pastor just because I don't feel fully qualified uh, to deal with some of these cases. And so I think, uh, especially in an Asian American context, uh, there are definitely some reasons, whether it's from their upbringing or from their family experiences, that drive a lot of that anxiety and depression. Um, but it comes out, especially in their emerging adult years, uh, when they're at college or even after they graduate college or making significant life decisions, uh, this is when they experience a lot of crisis in mm -hmm. their lives. So that's something pastoral we're dealing with all the time. Yeah, yeah. How about in your case, Jerrica, just uh, challenges that you think yeah. emerging adults are facing? I think there's a tension um, in my demographic between success and survival. Um, success meaning if you grew up on the south side of Chicago with a limited academic experience or housing or access to health care, access to good education, um, the biggest question is um, what does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to um, be able to afford resources for your life? Um, whether it's finding a good job or housing. Um, and that's one tension. Um, the other tension is that of survival um, and success, meaning let's say there's a young adult um, that has access to means and resources. Let's say they have a good job. Let's say they have the opportunity for health care. Let's say they have um, living on the northwest side of Chicago where I live and on Logan Square. Some of the issues they may ask is, okay, I, I'm seen as successful, but how am I spiritually surviving? How am I uh, ethnically surviving? Constantly navigating and asking the question, where is their safe space? Um, specifically, my husband and I are emerging adults. I'm 25 years old. And there's always a struggle to even find in Chicago a restaurant where we're not the only ones, whether it's we're going on a date night and where do we find ourselves where we can actually be comfortable in the city of Chicago, given that most black and brown communities are relegated to the south or west sides. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is which finding a church home. Um, are you going to find a place where you're going to be ethnically at home and welcome, where you can be who you are and not just be in the pews consuming majority culture, but contributing to the life of the church and finding yourself not just surviving in these spaces, but thriving ethnically. And then one of the largest issues is whether or not we're going to live tomorrow. Um, you guys have seen the news. You know that Black Lives Matter movement is happening right now. Walter Scott. Um, yeah. and, and then the lives of young black men and women, they're asking, will I be next? Mm. And that's a very weighty question to ask. Um, will I be the next person that I read about on the news? Um, whether I'm going to pick up my trash and a cop stops me because I don't look like I belong in my neighborhood, or the issue of, okay, the policing always happens in my community and will I be stopped in a random traffic stop? And where does God intersect with that? Because those are real life issues. Um, so in the church, the biggest question is, God, it seems as though I'm struggling to even survive and be successful. Do you love me? Do you care for me? Um, is my identity affirmed? In America, where I still feel like a second-class citizen, does God see me that way? Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest challenge is, uh, is God for us or is he against us, based on the way in which we view and see the world? Um, and those issues are stratified, because um, yeah. the, <laughs> the racial category black is encompassing. Um, so the experiences for Caribbean people may be different. The experience for Africans may be different. Um, but speaking from African-American context, that's one of the forefront issues. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jerrica. How about in your case, Jonathan? Uh, I would say in my context, one of the biggest things that I'm dealing with is just identity issues. Um, they kind of have, uh, being second generation or third generation in some cases, they kind of have one foot in each culture. So at home, they have their 
Hispanic context and then they go to a public school um, and, and get the kind of the Americanized culture in, in that context. So I, I think they, they're struggling to figure out which, which am I, which do I relate to more, and what, I, what I'm trying to encourage them is to, is to see that they're both and, and to kind of integrate both of those. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that uh, even in some of these conversations about cultural hybridity that, that theologians are having, that others are having, is uh, this idea of two-ness, of belonging and not belonging, of being part of a community and not being part of a community, of navigating spaces, of being defined by others, and then also of striving to be definable, so to, to mark out one's identity as different from but part of communities. So, so it sounds like in each, in each of your contexts that, that some of those questions, those aren't the only questions, but some of those questions are really at, at the forefront. Next question, uh, what are some of the family dynamics that emerging adults in your context are facing, whether that's positive or negative? So you can chime in on both, uh, on one in particular, but just as emerging adults are coming into your uh, churches, into your uh, parachurch ministries, whatever the case might be, um, they're coming out of families and dealing with different uh, family dynamics, some of which are good, some of which aren't. So I'm just interested in what you're observing in your uh, work with, uh, with emerging adults and what, what you're seeing on the ground. We, ha we have a lot of members who come from uh, immigrant backgrounds, so their parents immigrated to the States and then they were born here in the U.S. So they're second generation immigrants and um, many of them have parents who actually were very successful in the U.S. Uh, whether they got um, graduate degrees here or they went on uh, to become uh, professional. And so there's a lot of pressure that's placed on them to succeed at the same level or even beyond. At the same time, we have a lot of blue collar immigrant parents um, who really struggled or sacrificed to come to the United States. And there's even, uh, even a greater pressure placed on the children to succeed and make it. And success is defined very narrowly uh, in academic terms and in career success. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think uh, all of that pressure, along with the cultural pressure of trying to navigate between their American identity and their, uh, maybe their Asian background, all of that uh, is uh, something that's very difficult for our members to deal with uh, as they're trying to make decisions about their lives even uh, during their emerging adult years. So I think that's one of the, the family struggles that many of our uh, members share in common. Whether their parents are successful or not successful, um, they all carry that with them, that kind of uh, social pressure. And so I think that drives a lot of their anxiety. It drives a lot of their questions about their relationship with God. Yeah. Also drives um, even their involvement in church. You know, Many of them struggle just to be, participate in the life of the church because they're constantly weighing this pressure from home. And so, um, you know, I think that's one of the uh, unique things that Asian Americans are, are struggling through, especially uh, during these years it comes out. Right. Now, before we get to our next panelist, one of the things we shared uh, before coming over to, to have this panel was that in some context, a college student will hear from his or her parents, if you fail out of school, we'll always love you. But in other contexts, especially immigrant contexts, a college student will hear from his or her parents, if you fail out of school, you'll bring shame upon our family and you'll invalidate the reason we immigrated here to provide access and opportunity for you that we didn't have. So talk about pressure. Uh, talk about anxiety uh, in trying to be successful. But I'm sorry to interject. How about you, no, Derica, in your it, case, family dynamics? Uh, I think it's very interesting because some of the make it mentality for the sake of your family, uh, I use a phrase called making it versus making a difference. And sometimes what we find is um, young adults or those in college will make a decision economically based on uh, whether they're making it or making a difference. So let's say one, one person feels a calling to ministry, but they look at the dollar sign in which they'll be bringing home and ask the question, but is this what's best for my family financially? Um, for instance, um, there was one staff candidate for um, InterVarsity, and she really felt a calling um, to serve the next generation. But because her mom is an immigrant, and because there's struggles to pay the bills at times, she asked the question, can I afford to fundraise? 
for the sake of my family. Um, so questions like that. Another question is, uh, there's a new show called Being Mary Jane. I'm not sure how many of you actually watch it, but it's very popular for African Americans. And it's a show about a woman who is a television newscaster. She's very successful, a CNN, but she has a family that's very dramatic. Um, there's issues that go on in her family. Um, I think that's something that's very similar to a lot of um, people that are coming from my context is that if they make it, there's still those around them that may not have reached the same level of success. So what does it mean to interact with family members that may have a different socioeconomic status from you? Or what does it mean to maintain relationships with when you have a family member that's living, let's say in Inglewood, but you find yourself living in Lincoln Park? Um, what are those relationships, what do those relationships look like as you find yourself distanced for the sake of economic progress? And I've been lingering on economics, but the facts of life are economics impact a lot of our life, um, our life stages and life decisions. So that's kind of some of the things I've been noticing with family. Yeah. How about in your case, Jonathan? Um, well, the Hispanic uh, community, I think, is known for uh, very tight family uh, relationships. But the interesting thing is that with between first and second generation, there's a lot of tension, even though there's a lot of loyalty to family. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the parents that came to this country um, in not all cases, but in a lot of cases, came here without documentation. Um, so that just the way that the family lives and, and changes, <laughs> it brings up security issues, it brings up a lot of fear, a lot of um, instability. Uh, it also uh, requires oftentimes both parents to be working, which means that the kids sometimes are alone in the house and they end up being raised by other things that are not their family. Um, with the kids going to the public schools and stuff, they are learning English, um, which in a lot of cases the parents don't speak English or don't speak it well. Uh, so the kids, in some sense, kind of raise a, rise above their parents in that, in that aspect. Also in education, uh, the fact that these kids are, a lot of them are graduating high school, um, maybe in some cases their parents did not. Um, so there's, there's some tension in that. And it, it's, it's sad because the, the, the parents came to this country because they wanted to give a better life to their family. And they wanted their kids to be able to have protection and security and to have the things that they couldn't. And so they're slaving away, in a lot of cases, working two jobs, sometimes three, and they give everything, literally everything to their kids. Like, <laughs> everything that they ask, they have. And I, and I look at the things that they have and I'm just like, what? <laughs> when I was your age, I didn't have that stuff. Um, but it's, the parents are trying to, you know, give this future to their kids and I think what they don't understand is that sometimes they ended up, they're hurting their kids in, in, in doing that because they're, they're creating within their kids this sense of entitlement um, for them to think that, oh, I, I deserve all this stuff. Um, and, not, and not in the church that I'm at now, but the church that I was at previously, uh, there was just a very sad and difficult situation that I, I had to deal with that uh, you know, two immigrant uh, parents uh, had uh, two boys, uh, both of them were heavily involved in, in gangs and drugs and jail. And, you know, when I started to ask questions about the family, it's like the parents were never home. So part, I, I think part of the, the, the parents are wanting to give this perfect future to their kids, but I think they're not realizing that in making those kind of sacrifices, they're also losing the ability to be able to influence their, their children and to raise them in a way that is ultimately going to be God honoring. Yeah. Now in each of your situations, you've talked about family dynamics, you've talked about some of the real challenges that uh, people in, in your churches and ministries are facing. What kind of uh, positive things do you see in family dynamics in, uh, among emerging adults that you work with that you think are you know, that are, that are gospel-centered, that are hopeful, that, that inspire you in the work that you do. So anyone can chime in. We don't have to go in order. I was just thinking about sacrifice, because you, you mentioned some of the, the challenges of sacrifice, but I think as we look at motherhood and fatherhood in black communities, that sacrifice is something that is um, seen as to be esteemed. 
Um, so sacrifice, the, the sacrifices you made for a better opportunity, um, those came with the negative aspects too, but there's a lot of positives to that, the idea of sacrifice. So we look at Jesus on the cross, we look at sacrifice, they see that in their family. Um, another thing is kinship. Um, this thing just went off. I'll give it to Jimmy. Okay, great. Jimmy, kinship. Um, historically, kinship in our communities has always been very broad. The nuclear family unit, the father, the mom, beaver, cleaver, uh, that's not very like typical. There's cousins, there's great cousins, there's second cousins, third cousins, fifth cousins. There's that person that's down the street that's somehow considered a part of your family. Kinship is very wide and broad. The idea of belonging um, to where you can have someone that's only been around your family for a few weeks, but then when they come in, they're treated as family. Um, and that's very broad and beautiful. I think it's a reflection of God's heart and his inclusivity. Yeah. How about uh, either of uh, our other two panelists? Anything else you notice about fam family dynamics that you think are really redemptive and that, that you think uh, bless your context? Even though I did talk about this negatively, it, the sense that, they're, that the family did come to provide a better future for their kids, in, a, in, in many ways their kids are getting a better future. Uh, they are being educated, they're going to have much more opportunities for, for job, um, for raising a family that, that they didn't have. Uh, and that's, that's one thing that, I'm, that even though there are those tensions there, th those are things that I try to highlight to the kids to, to realize that their parents have really done a lot for them and if they only knew what their parents had to go through to get to this country and to do the things that they've done, I think they would have a completely different mentality. Um, so in a sense, you know, that, that kind of sacrifice, that kind of, um, you know, looking to the needs of their kids um, is, a, is a positive thing as well, even though it has created some tension. Yeah, I would, uh, I would just back. echo that. Um, <laughs> Here, I'll take it. I would just echo um, just the sentiment of uh, sacrif sacrificially uh, giving um, for the next generation. And actually, that's something that um, we grew up with, the mentality of uh, giving up our own dreams for the next generation. That as a second generation, I, I feel like uh, as a Korean American, we're losing that, even as we think about our own children, um, learning how to sacrifice for the sake of others. So I think that vision, you know, to see the next generation reach with the gospel was something that uh, we're we were blessed by. Yeah. One of the things I've noticed just uh, among my, my, my dad's one of eight children, and uh, I probably have about between 75 and 100 family members, just in Honduras alone, that doesn't include uh, scattered throughout different places. But that idea of kinship is, is very real, that um, a, a cousin's daughter's uh, boyfriend could come to my house in Illinois and he'd be treated as family, or come to my parents' house in New Jersey and he'd be family. In a, in a beautiful way, I think. Uh, so, that, so there's lots of really, really powerful things. And sacrifice was something that, I, that we don't want to just uh, overgeneralize or stereotype, but I know that in my family growing up, uh, my parents were insistent on making sacrifices so that my sisters and I would have opportunities that they did, did not. So and now some of that uh, translated into pressure. So for example, like not going to college was not an option. Uh, in my family because my dad would say things like I didn't immigrate to this country I didn't have to face people uh, you know writing petitions to keep me out of their neighborhoods for you not to go to college so there was some of that that pressure but my parents were also very very committed to making the sacrifices that they felt like they should and needed to make in order for us to have opportunities that they didn't so that, uh, just love hearing your, your interactions on this. Does anyone else want to chime in with something else before we move on to our next question? We'll open it up to the floor, too, in just a minute. Okay, here's the next one. Uh, what similarities do you see between emerging adults in your ministries and majority culture emerging adults? So points of convergence, and then also I want to talk about points of divergence. So what dissimilarities or what differences do you see in your context and the issues that those in majority culture situations might be facing in a different context mm -hmm. so we'll we don't have to go in order just just what comes to your mind as you think about that points of convergence and points of divergence um, there's a great book written by James Chong called, um, well, two, True Story and the Other is Real Life, where he talks about millennials. And the question is, millennials don't just want to know, is Christianity true? They want to know if it's real. 
if it's something that has an effect and an impact on society. Millennials really care about making a difference in the world. I think we're seeing a generation of young black activists that believe that Jesus isn't just true, but he's actually good news for our world. Um, activists that aren't just activists for the sake of society, but for the sake of God's kingdom and seeing it come, um, that are rooted and grounded in love for God, love for the scriptures, but also love for the world and his redemptive work. Um, there's a desire to see redemption. Uh, I think that's partnered alongside our, um, our majority culture brothers and sisters, a desire to see our world transformed and changed. Um, and that's one of the, the things that we have in common. And it's a great point of partnering and connection if we could only see eye to eye. Thanks, Jerrica. How about others? Other points of convergence or divergence that you see? Um, I definitely see the similarities of uh, the need for relationship. Uh, even cross-culturally. I think in this generation there is um, a real desire for people to walk alongside them. I think that might look different though in, in for example, in my context where uh, people coming from Asian American backgrounds, especially East Asia, um, you know, their relationships are very um, high, what they call high context, meaning uh, the rules by which you relate to uh, another person are governed by uh, the social cues and uh, the customs of the culture. And so uh, even though there might be a great desire for a relationship, that relationship uh, oftentimes might look very different. So uh, for example, as a pastor, I'm an authority figure. So I can tell people crave um, a relationship because they're millennials and they desire for authentic community. But at the same time, uh, many of my members don't know how to relate with me. Um, they're not used to the pastor walking alongside them. You know, they still want to see me as an authority figure. So for myself, this is a bit of a quandary. You know, how do I relate with my members? You know, I don't want to just be a, an authority figure in their lives. Uh, at the same time, it's very difficult for me to walk alongside them. So I'm still wrestling with that and still trying to understand how I can navigate through that kind of high context relational understanding of life and try to minister in that context. And I realize at least um, for, for us, there's a, a great need for mediators to come in between um, authority figures as well as uh, other figures who represent um, a lead leadership in their lives. So. Uh, traditionally, in the immigrant church, uh, I'll speak on for Korean immigrants, um, it's, the youth would go to church because they needed people that can speak to them uh, about their problems at home. They couldn't speak to their parents. They don't, they don't feel comfortable speaking with their parents about some of their problems or their personal issues. So the church actually became an outlet for that. So the youth pastor or some other Bible study leaders would be people they would feel safe sharing some of these problems with. Uh, now as uh, millennials get older and they're coming to church on their own anymore, they're not in a youth group context anymore, I realize they're, they're in a, um, a bit of a, a struggle to find that safe outlet for them. You know, they wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable coming to myself as a pastor and they need uh, other older believers, more mature believers, to come alongside them. So I think actually that creates a great opportunity for the body of Christ to come together, uh, not just for pastors and leaders um, to disciple, but for mature believers as part of the body of Christ to reach the next generation. Uh, but I think that idea of having mediators come in between uh, relationships actually opens a door for discipleship, but it's, um, it's something that's hard to navigate through sometimes. Yeah, yeah. How about in your case, Jonathan? What are you seeing? Points of convergence and points of divergence? Um, I think a lot of similarities to what's, to what's been shared. Um, you know, questions of identity, who we are, what we, what we, what we believe. Um, I think those are things that in general emerging, emerging adults are, are, are dealing with. Um, it, but in my, my context, it's, you have to you need to do those things, but I, you also have to kind of cross some cultural barriers to, to get there. Um, and the, the kids, I, I, I've been very surprised. I had no clue like, what they were going to be like when I, when I walked into this. Because I knew that Venezuela and, and here was going to be very different. But I had no clue what they would actually be like. Um, and I've been very surprised at how... Um, 
curious they are, how many questions, like really deep theological questions, not, not too long, right around Easter time, like they're asking questions, they, they didn't phrase it this way because I don't know the terminology, but they're, ta they're asking me stuff about substitutionary atonement, justification, trinity, I'm like, what, <laughs> this is awesome, like I, I was so jazzed up that they were asking me that stuff, but they have a deep desire to really know, is this true, is this real, um, and they want to know it for themselves, um, although it's interesting that they think that they're Christian be, just because they go to church. <laughs> and I, I've had a lot of them come up to me and tell me, oh, I was born Christian. And I was like, really? <laughs> uh, so I push back a lot with them on that, um, but it's just trying to, to be there with them to help them work through these questions that they have and, and to let them know that, hey, like, it's okay for you to have these questions, it's okay to have these kind of conversations, and that's something that from the very beginning I was trying to be very upfront with them about is that like in, in, our, in our time together we can talk about anything. Uh, no topic's going to be off the table. Um, and so that thankfully that's been going very well. Here's another question and we'll open it up to the floor in just a minute um, after this. But I'm interested in uh, emerging adults in your context and what sorts of uh, stereotypes, caricatures, um, uh, racist encounters they're experiencing, and how they're trying to negotiate those encounters as Christ followers. So uh, I know I didn't prep you for this question, but I really am interested uh, in, in what, what students, in your case students, in your case, well, your case students as well, but some students, some uh, in careers now, but how are they trying to navigate their ethnic identities when, uh, whether it's in the business world, whether it's in the church, because it's not like it's not in the church, uh, whether it's um, in their families, uh, whatever, the, whatever the domain, what encounters are they having and how are they trying to navigate those encounters? I know that's a big question, but I'm really interested. So who wants to chime in first? Um. They are facing those kind of issues, I, and I was actually surprised about that. Um, they, they would make some comments about white people, and I'd just be like, what? <laughs> it, like, in their schools, uh, things that they, they have a perception about white people, and the, and the funny thing is, is like, I'm a white guy. Um, but they don't, they don't see me that way, but, but they look at, at that, and there's, there's tension there, so they get in fights with kids. Um, I've had to talk with them about that um, and I and I ask you know what what why are you getting into fights with these kids and so typically what they what some of them have said to me is well like if they're making fun of me personally I it doesn't it doesn't bother me but when they start making fun of my family then that's when I lose it so you know like the I guess kids in their schools are making fun of them about the the kind of jobs that their parents might have, kind of the stereotypic Hispanic, like they're going to be in the factories or in the fields or you know whatever, um, and and those have been things that have um, been a problem that they've had to deal with. And I I didn't know if it would be like that or not, but it but it has been. Um, mm. And so, you know, I, I one of the first things that I did when I when I started there was I I did a series on our identity in Christ and and also trying to help them see that their identity as Hispanic Americans is a, is a beautiful thing that God um, has privileged them with. Because even though I'm not Hispanic, my wife is, and I feel very much um, that part of me is. And, it's, and, it, and it is so much in a way that I can't separate that from myself now. And being bilingual and, and being between both cultures, it's, it's a part of me, and I see that as, as God... God's design in my life, I see that as a way of helping me look at the world in a different way and appreciating the world in a different way and having a mind for missions in a completely different way. And that's something that I'm trying to encourage these kids with, that, that even though you have these kind of, you have this tension in your life and you have the people who look at you and, and, and have these stereotypes about you, this is actually something very unique that you have the ability to be able to do and that this is part of God's creation, and, and I want them to see the value of that. I really do. Before we get to our next panelist, uh, sometimes I'll hear someone sharing a story and a, a memory will come to mind. And I, I remembered my last physical fight, which was a long time ago, uh, Jersey kid, and had a little bit of a 
rough side to me. Uh, but my last physical fight was over a kid who made fun of my father's accent and job. Uh, and that, some, for some reason, hit some place very deep in me that I just reacted without any real sense of knowing what I was doing, but just, just instinctively got into a, into a fight. So it's interesting to hear yeah. you share stories that, that uh, young adults in your ministry are facing yeah. those kinds of situations, in, especially in the high school context. Yeah, yeah. How about uh, either of you, just what you're observing about uh, race, ethnicity, uh, we can also talk about class, gender, just all those dynamics and what uh, emerging adults in your uh, ministries are doing and what they're encountering and how they're navigating. I would say for Asian Americans in, our, in my experience, um, I think our identity in our role in society actually is a bit confusing. So we're minorities, but um, I think our experiences in America might be uh, different from other minorities. Um, our emphasis upon education and, and trying to uh, find careers, and I think that's all been uh, part of a stereotype for Asian Americans that we're model minorities. And so I think that places some confusion about our role in society. You know, who are we um, to, what are we to stand up for? What are we to speak about? What are the issues that we are to relate with? And so we definitely, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, empathy towards some of the racial you know, discrimination and injustice that we see going on even today. And there's a lot of interest in that area, but at the same time, there's a lot of confusion of how to get involved, how to support that. And so a lot of our um, parents and uh, the communities that we grew up with have been very isolated from society as a whole. And so this is a, a kind of a new idea of engaging with culture, engaging with society as we become emerging adults. And so this is a kind of time of discovery for a lot of Asian Americans to engage with some of these issues, even uh, within the body of Christ as well. So, One of the points of convergence that I see between uh, Latino emerging adults and Asian American emerging adults, whether it's Korean, Korean American or, or uh, other situations, is this idea of uh, being a perpetual foreigner. Uh, Frank Wu wrote a book called Yellow, and he has a whole chapter on, uh, called Perpetual Foreigner. So uh, he argues in that book, and I think it applies to Latino context as well, this idea that no matter how long you've been in this country, you're new to this country. So someone would say something like, well, how long have you been here? And, and the response would be, well, I've been here for five generations. Or when did you immigrate to this country? Uh, in a Latino context, someone who grew up in the Southwest, they would say, well, no, actually, I didn't immigrate here. America immigrated to me. Uh, we didn't go anywhere. America, in its expansionist, imperialist ways, immigrated to us. We've been here for hundreds of years. So those kinds of dynamics uh, play out, I think, uh, in your context. Yeah, I think that just adds to the confusion. I, I, mean, I have a lot of stories, uh, you've probably seen videos of this, but they'll ask, you know, oh, your English is really good, you know? Uh, how long have you been in this country? Well, I was born in this country. Oh, well, where are you from? You know, what? Well, I was really born from, from yeah. born here, you know? But where are you really from? Well, well, my parents were actually, I had a friend who was fifth generation, you know, um, Chinese American. And uh, his parents have been here longer than most of you know his friends' parents who are American, and so that kind of uh, that kind of feeling makes us more feel more isolated, right. and uh, there's an ambivalence towards engaging culture a little bit more. So I, I definitely agree with that. Right. I remember having a conversation with a, a Palestinian Christian, and someone asked him, "So how long has Christianity been in your family?" And his answer was, "A thousand years." <laughs> <laughs> So he was trying to push back. Well, no, actually, Christianity has been with us a lot longer than it's been with you. Yeah, how about in your case, Jerrica? Yeah, it's really challenging to ask, to answer this question in that life is an all-encompassing microaggression. Um, how many of you know what the word microaggression is? Okay, great. Um, so microaggression. So from a time, I'm going to go back a little further. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, thank sure. you. All right, so colonialism. Yeah. Um, the idea of let's expand our territories, let's go into this land, um, make a cash crop out of it, and let's bring in some free labor um, to make it free labor so we can progress as a, co as a colony. But what does it take to colonize someone? Brutality, physical brutality, um, conquering a people physically, but also the colonization of the mind. Um, colonizing involves 
basically deconstructing and dismantling someone's sense of self, sense of belonging, sense of self-worth. Um, colonialism has been with my people for as long as we have been in the United States. Um, so imagine um, coming here, working here, and perpetually being seen as less than, and not just less than, only fit to serve. Um, so much so, the idea of Darwinism, uh, I used to be considered less than an ape, an animal. Um, so 300 years, 400 years beyond slavery and colonialism, I'm somehow supposed to evolve in American society from being seen as an animal to a human being. Okay, that's one thing. Um, second thing, um, gender. Um, Black family units, um, black men and black women. Black women in slavery are our bodies to produce, produce cattle slavery. So I'm producing children whose only purpose is to serve. Um, on top of that, black men seen as feared, to be feared. Those images don't go away in a few centuries. They follow us um, beyond that. So when someone sees my husband, they may not think he's a minister of the gospel. They may think he's a criminal. Um, we think about the history and legacies in our country, black men being lynched um, for fear, whether it's they touched a white woman or um, they said um, no instead of no, no sir, no ma'am. That's in the 60s, 40s, 50s. And then moving on to MLK's last final campaign, the I am a man, the need to assert your dignity as a human being. Um, as a woman, my identity is not in my sexuality, it's in my, my human dignity. Um, so there's always a sense of foreignness in that we're always juxtaposed against whiteness. Um, so from the texture of my hair to the way I speak, my vernacular ways of being, colonization dismantles that and makes it less than. We're living in a post-colonial society. Um, this doesn't just impact me, it impacts everyone. <laughs> People in your context where yeah. you're ministering. Where I minister, yeah. yeah. So now they're on college campuses and they're in these classes and they may be hearing about their history from one perspective. So they're not necessarily always hearing about their contributions to society. The microaggressions of someone saying, oh I didn't imagine your hair to be that soft. Um, to someone asking for your ID on campus because you don't look like a student. Um, if we move into the professional atmosphere, what do we perceive as professional? Um, how must I do my hair so as not to be construed as unprofessional? Are these earrings too dangly? Do they make me look ghetto? Um, can I wear this outfit to work? Uh, as a woman, can I be assertive and not be called an angry black woman? As a man, can you assert yourself and not be compared to someone um, that's violent. Um, those are just in those contexts. Um, in the church, it becomes even more complicated. Um, but I'll save that. For, if someone has a question about that, I'll leave that hanging. Yeah, I remember uh, watching an interview of uh, the editor of Latina magazine. And she was getting ready to do a presentation at uh, a hotel conference room. And she was walking down the hall in a, a beautiful dress, getting ready to give the presentation. Someone was walking the other direction and handed her his empty ice bucket and explained to her where his room was and where she needed to go to bring him the ice. So those kinds of interactions with caricatures, stereotypes, generalizations, people making assumptions uh, based on what someone looks like uh, about when they came to this country, about who they are, who they want to be, uh, all of those things are really complex and trying to navigate those issues, whether it's in emerging adulthood or, or later on in life, is, is very, very complicated. So I've talked to several Latinos who really struggle with like machismo, machista culture because they're Christ followers and they, they want to disassociate themselves from some of those things. But at the same time, they love family, they love their family, and they love their parents. So it's just, it's just difficult, it's complex, and I don't pretend that I or, or any of us know all the answers to that, but it's just very fascinating, it's illuminating to hear you tell your stories and talk about the issues that people in your context are facing. Let's open it up to the floor. Um, people can ask questions, but you can also share stories, things that you're seeing on the ground in your ministry context. I don't think we have a microphone to pass around, but if you wanna just stand and uh, speak loudly for everyone to hear, I uh, would love to hear from you as to questions you have, stories you want to share for our panel. Oh, and I'll repeat the question, or I can't maybe repeat the story, but if you have a question, I'll repeat it for everyone to hear. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I'm curious about whether your emerging adults and young and late adolescents have trouble with helicopter parenting. 
but especially yeah, any of you answer that because I feel like it's it's based on certain uh, race and socioeconomic classes, but. So the question is uh, helicopter parenting and whether or not you sense that's touching down among the emerging adults that you're working with. I would definitely agree, especially for Asian American uh, in Asian American context. There's a, a, a phrase called tiger moms, right, that's been popularized. And that's very true. I actually had a, a church member whose mom set up a video cam in her room and was uh, surveying her every move 24-7. And uh, this um, young person was really struggling, obviously, with her mom <laughs> and trying to find some help. And uh, so I, I see this phenomenon a lot. And so this is a big part of the, uh, their identity formation. Uh, they don't know how to make decisions for themselves. Even if we empower them, they're scared to make decisions for themselves and be responsible for themselves. Their parents are always rescuing them whenever they are in trouble. Um, I, I have students even um, these days who their parents are the ones calling in for to make doctor's appointments for them still in college. Their parents are the ones talking to uh, the professors if they get into trouble. So this is a huge problem, especially for Asian Americans. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how to um, address that issue, but the whole idea, we need people to come be a mediator between relationships, I think, is uh, something that's very significant. And we need people to build bridges, you know, where young people really struggle um, to get some of the kinds of mentoring and discipleship that they need. Uh, we need others to kind of come along and help them, where maybe parents were unable to speak and communicate to their kids. I would just say, what you know, another factor to that, especially. Um, for a lot of Asian uh, children is uh, they might not speak their parents' language. Uh, my mom's lived in the United States for over 40 years. She doesn't speak English at all. And my Korean's not flu fluent. So somehow we were able to communicate. I don't know how. I'm still wondering how we were able to build this relationship. But um, this is a huge factor in the way I relate to my parents. And so there's a huge communication gap. So that necessitates other people providing support and other people coming alongside of uh, emerging adults. And uh, I really see that's part of what our ministry is as a church, to try to come alongside these emerging adults, especially as they're dealing with some of their parents. Dr. Cha, actually my colleague on the faculty, co-wrote a book called Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents, talking about uh, Asian American contexts and trying to make sense of those dynamics of wanting to honor that generation that's made so many sacrifices, but at the same time needing to mark out one's own journey and path and identity and Christian discipleship uh, and, and moving forward in those ways. So, uh, interesting comment. How about uh, uh, the other two panelists? Yeah, well, to kind of follow up with uh, what was just said, um, with the church that I'm in now, uh, they. There was a couple generations before of young adults that basically were lost. Uh, the church didn't do anything to try and, and reach them. Um, and so they, like the, the parents, <laughs> they look at, I think this is in general, parents don't understand their teenagers and teenagers think that their parents don't understand them. Um, but this is even more amplified within the Hispanic context because of uh, language issues, uh, cultural differences, um, and so there is that need for, in this case, in the, church's, in the church's context of bringing along a youth pastor who can speak both languages to them, can understand both kind of the context that they're both in. So that is, that is something that's, that's very necessary. Mm -hmm. How about in your case, uh, yeah, Jerrica? Great question. Um, so I work with students that are across the African diaspora, so this question is different depending on which I'm talking about. For my Nigerian students, uh, the word helicopter is very interesting because it's more so, that's just, that's just family. Like, that's family, like your decisions are on your own. They're the family's decisions. Um, so if they want to go to a conference, they're going to call their mom and dad. Um, this strong fam familial ties. Um, for my African-American students, it's a little different because if they've gotten to the point where they've gotten to college, most likely they filled out the FAFSA by themselves they've learned to navigate bureaucracies by themselves in ways that their parents haven't before them because their parents may not have gone to college. Um, so things like, oh, I don't know how to fill out your FAFSA. 
they have to find that out on their own. So a lot of that independence is them navigating for themselves what will life look like, keeping family in mind. But for African Americans, a lot of that is forging forward into some grounds their family may not have gone. So their family may not even be able to give input on, okay, maybe this isn't the best scholarship option for you because they may not know how to navigate um, financial aid. Um, so those are some of the dynamics with helicopter parenting. This will stratify it depending on ethnicity. Yeah. Other questions that people want to share or stories that people have that they want to share about min their ministry context and working with emerging adults? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm in uh, suburban St. Louis where I work yeah, with emerging adults. Yeah. How, uh, go ahead. How does someone from a majority culture create and invite opportunities for those from minority cultures to plug into emerging adult ministries and a part of their church? Mm, great question. What are your thoughts, each, each panelist, just thoughts on, um, on how, how we would, what steps, what steps uh, those leading emerging adult ministries would, would need to take in order to, um, to reach multiple constituencies, multiple contexts, multiple ethnicities and races? I was going to say doing a diagnostic is really helpful in asset and accessing what is the culture here and having informants to say, before you even invite anybody in, because sometimes like we invite people places, but we're not ready to be hospitable. So let's say I'm inviting someone over for dinner, and I don't ask them, so what do you like to eat? They get there, and I serve them uh, Alfredo, but they're lactose intolerant. <laughs> That's not going to be a very friendly meal. We do that sometimes at our congregations. We invite people in, and we're not really, really ready to prepare for them. So then my first step is do a diagnostic. Ask yourself, what are the things that are happening here that may be inhospitable? Um, for others. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for a moment. Mm. I would say just generally, you know, listening to their stories, understanding their problems. Um, we have uh, an Anglo pastor, we're part of family churches, and he's working with a lot of Asian Americans in our church. And um, this uh, member was trying to share how they felt a lot of pressure uh, at school and all these things are happening. And our pastor's response was, wow, uh, your parents really don't love you, you know. And uh, our member felt so ashamed, you know, and felt further discouraged by that. But I think this, you know, pastor had good intentions, but just did not understand the depth of this person's problem and didn't try to enter into their worldview and to understand where the parents were coming from. So uh, I think the parents would... Uh, feel the exact opposite. It's because we love you so much. That's why we want you to do so well and we want you to do this and we feel like you should make this decision. Um, so I think that having that dialogue and really entering into their story, I think is a, it takes a long time. It's a process and it doesn't happen easily because sometimes uh, they may be more passive. Uh, but you might have to take some extra steps in identifying uh, different minorities in your group and trying to listen to where they come from. Anything you want to add, Jonathan? Just uh, no, th that was well said. Things you want to share? Yeah, I know that, uh, it d like for example, uh, some of the university staff that I talk to talk about shared power. So it's not just about representation. So for example, take a worship team you could have representation on the platform, but not shared power. So the power holders might still be majority culture, uh, even if representation is present. Does that make sense? Uh, so for example, there was a recent uh, issue involving a student at UVA, and because the university staff there was committed to shared power, students who were white students, students who were black students, students who were Asian American, Latino, whatever the case might be, they had leaders to turn to who were uh, in leadership teams where, where what, what they had to say mattered. So they weren't powerless in those teams. Uh, other comments that you want to share? I know that for, for me, uh, whether it's autobiographical or when I talk to uh, people who are coming out of non-majority context, I know a question that keeps coming up is, am I a guest in this situation or am I a member of the family? And if I feel like someone's offering hospitality in such a way that I'm a guest, then that actually feels condescending rather than helpful. Or if I feel like culture 
is only expressed at the superficial above the surface level of food and customs uh, and not beliefs and values, then that also feels condescending. Uh, and we need to think about complexifying even these categories. Like for example, if someone comes up to me and says, I hope that you enjoy Cinco de Mayo, I would say, my father's Honduran. I don't, I don't celebrate <laughs> Cinco de Mayo, that's a Mexican holiday. Right? So those kinds of conversations are really, really significant, especially on these particular issues. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but it's a great question. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I was just going to say that for Hispanic um, uh, culture, that's, that's a really good point because there is this stereotype that every Hispanic is Mexican. <laughs> and and they're, they're not. Um, they're, and it, it's actually quite amazing the differences that, are, that there are between for example, a Venezuelan and a Mexican. There's a, there's a lot of differences. Even vocabulary, words that they use are very different. Um, so that's, that's a helpful point there. Yeah, there's a, there's a phenomenon in sociology called beta bias. And it, the, the point of this phenomenon is to, or this discussion on beta bias is to help people understand that there's often as much difference within categories as there is across categories. So for example, the category men and women or African-American. Well, there's often as much difference within that category as there is across the black-white category. Mm -hmm. So trying to complicate even the categories that we use, that's, that's a, significant, a significant and important distinction. So with Latin American, Latino categories, my wife's half Puerto Rican, I'm half Honduran, there's some shared family resemblance of, of Latin American-ness, but there's also divergence. And at least understanding and acknowledging that divergence is significant. Anyway, I know that's not your question, but, <laughs> but it's very helpful. Time for one more question. Go ahead. What do you believe is more valuable for the emerging adults in your various cultural specifics? Is it more valuable to them to belong to communities that are racially and culturally specific? Or is it more valuable to them to belong to those that are multicultural? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question, and the question, I, uh, I'm going to do my best to restate it, but among emerging adults in your contexts, uh, would it be more important to be part of a multi-ethnic congregation, community, and to have that sense of belonging in that community, or more of a monocultural, you all know what I mean by that, uh, monocultural setting in which uh, the emerging adults you're working with can, can identify, resonate with, be connected to uh, those who might share some of their their family resemblances and stories. I was just going to say your question is really complicated. Um, it depends, right? Because it depends. But also, we live in a society where um, safe space for some minorities is really hard to find. Um, you spend, you go to work nine to five, and let's say you work at Groupon. Um, predominantly white office, you're navigating cultural norms. Let's say you go home and you're going to the bar with your friends, and let's say you live in Lincoln Park and you go to O'Malley's. Um, you're, again, cross, crossing cultures. And then let's say Friday night, you and your friends go to see a movie and the representations of yourself are not, either not present or they're negative. And let's say Sunday morning comes. And on Sunday morning, you go to church, and let's say it's a multi-ethnic church, where there's representation but not shared power, where they're singing Hillsong. And it's a black person, but they're singing Hillsong. But there's no recognition of difference. Um, so you're in a multi-ethnic space but it's not necessarily a safe space. It's not necessarily a space where you feel like you do belong. That was my story, and that has been my story for years. And it led to a, a bit of trauma in my life where I was thirsting and hungering for a place where God would say that who you are is good and beautiful and you belong. Um, so I ended up leaving a multi-ethnic church, multi-ethnic, <laughs> and going to a specifically black church where me and my husband now serve. Um, for my students, it's interesting because they are millennials. Millennials love racially diverse. But the thing about millennials is sometimes they don't necessarily know what does that look like in the work it takes. Multi-ethnic communities are not easy. They are hard. If you're doing it right, it should be hard. You yeah. should be having tough conversations. You should be assessing power in those dynamics. There should be some weird tension every now and again because not everybody's happy with the worship set. Um, there's sacrifice in multi-ethnic community, but a lot of our multi-ethnic communities may not do that work because the power is still held in majority hands. So millennials want multi-ethnic communities. They want Christ-centered, Christ Jesus-reflecting multi-ethnic communities where everyone has a seat at the table. Um, but that's really hard to find. So sometimes they do go to ethnic-specific spaces to heal from the trauma and hurt of navigating so much. 
Anyone else on the panel want to chime in on the multi-ethnic, mono-ethnic uh, conversation? I think there's value in both. And, and, um, I came out of a Korean immigrant church context and then was part of a non-denominational multi-ethnic church. And so I, I valued um, my family growing up and being a part of that church where there's a real emphasis on kinship and growing up together, and then into a, a, a church plant context that was non-denominational, multi-ethnic, where there was a big emphasis on evangelism, social justice, and other issues that were new to me, but I developed in my faith a lot. I grew a lot from that experience. And I think that would help me grow just in my identity, not only as a follower of Christ, but even as a person. And I think that was a great experience for me. But uh, if I were to think about my life now, and I wanted to take my parents to church, and we wanted to go to a church together that was intergenerational, then I would have to have to reflect and think about where can we go to a church where my parents and I and my children now, uh, we can be a part of a church family together. And most, most likely that would have to be in a Korean context. You know, my parents don't speak English. They're not going to be able to fit into a, a, an American English speaking church. So uh, I think that's a great benefit too. Now, I, I just recently heard that there's a trend towards that where a lot of uh, emerging adults, coming people from an uh, immigrant background, Korean American background, who are um, past their emerging adult years now, they're returning back to their immigrant churches. There was a real exodus um, that happened about 10 years ago of uh, a lot of uh, second generation immigrants leaving the, their uh, Korean church. But now they're coming back because they're having kids, they wanna take care of their parents, uh, they want to worship together uh, between the generations. So I think there's value to that as well. So I think there's both sides. Uh, certain life stages, I think there's great value to learn from a multi-ethnic context, uh, as well as um, there's some great benefit to worshiping together intergenerationally uh, in a church family too. So I think there's both uh, benefits on both sides. Jonathan, you want to chime yeah, in on anything? I, I would agree with what's been said by... Um, by both of the panelists. And, and I would also say this is something I think they're going to have to wrestle with themselves, um, especially if, depending on who they marry. <laughs> it, they, they could marry somebody that's, that's not from their uh, cultural background, and they're going to have to wrestle with those issues. Um, and so it, that'll be interesting to see kind of how that takes place. I don't know exactly how that's going to look, um, but I, I would guess um, that you know, a lot of the kids that I'm ministering with will probably marry, not all of them, but some of them probably will marry somebody that's not from their cultural background. Uh, and I think that'll inherently bring those kind of questions and they're going to have to deal with those things. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Final question, and I'll just have you each take about a minute or less. Uh, what excites you? What's hopeful to you? What's redemptive to you about working with this particular uh, group uh, of people in your ministries, emerging adults? What what motivates you and excites you to continue the work you're doing? I think when I um, was uh, growing up in the church, I think I was always uh, captivated by the idea of how do I experience more of God? That was the kind of question that I always had in my mind. And a lot of my members um, who are millennials, instead of asking that question, they're always asking the question, how do I make a difference in the world? And uh, what can we do on our campus? What, what can we do in the city to make a difference? So I think that's a whole new way of thinking about Christianity, but I, I think there's uh, something very positive about that. There's something very exciting about that, even as we think about how do we, how do we mobilize the church, not just so that we can experience more of God in our worship gathering, but even outside of our church walls and uh, into our community. So that's, I think, a very exciting uh, uh, possibility. Yeah. How about Jerica or, uh, or Jonathan? I think for me, I think that um, what's most exciting is that there's a generation of people across the African diaspora that are starting to believe that God is for them and not against them. Mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a context where they've been told their entire life that you deserve to be where you are, that from you've been cursed of Ham to um, Jesus is your oppressor and he justifies slavery, to know like God loves me. And who he has created me to be is a reflection of himself. And that is a good and beautiful thing, first off. Second off, God is raising up a generation of world changers. People that are like Nehemiah, and they see the wall has been torn down. And they're not staying in their places of privilege. They're going back to make a difference in their communities unashamedly. 
um, I had the privilege of being at a conference called Black Campus Ministries 2015. Where we gathered hundreds of black students um, from across the Midwest, saw them worshiping and hearing for the first time that God loves them for all of who they are. He sees them where they're at. He knows their economic struggles. He knows about Black Lives Matter and he's actually on the front lines working for them and not against them. Mm. And that's exciting. Mm. I would say uh, what's really exciting for me is just by God's grace being a part of their discipleship um, and, and being a part of seeing this next generation rise up and, and how God's going to use them. Uh, like I said, you know, they're very inquisitive, they're asking lots of questions. Uh, there's a sincerity behind that, that that really motivates me, that really excites me about what God's going to do in their life. Um, so yeah, that makes it worth it for mm. me. Mm. Well, in just a moment, uh, Dr. Guthrie is going to come and just share some closing uh, announcements and maybe even uh, pray, pray since it's been a full day, uh, maybe close us in prayer. But before he does that, would you just join me in thanking our panelists for joining us? <laughs>